So I want you to make a prediction, and it's an easy one. I've got two identical balloons blown up to non-identical sizes. I've put some air into this one and much more air into this one. All this tubing just allows me to independently fill each balloon, and there's a valve in the middle. When I open the valve, the air is going to be able to move from balloon to balloon, and I want you to predict what's going to happen. Okay, I'm sure you've got an idea. I'm going to open the valve in three, two, one. Hmm. Turns out it's not such an easy prediction after all. So the small balloon got smaller, the bigger balloon got bigger. Now, my first thought when I saw this set up, my prediction was that the balloons would equalise, that some of the air would move from the large balloon to the small balloon until they were the same size. What I'm going to do in this video is explain why that didn't happen and also let you know about the first ever YouTube course in science communication that I've just released over on my own channel. Okay, let's get into this. Okay, so the expectations that the balloons would equalise actually comes from knowing a lot of physics, even if you don't know, you know. Um, let's start with a balloon. So when you blow up a balloon, you're essentially putting the contents of your lungs into a latex rubber bag, which is lovely. You're forcing that air in and the air molecules are bouncing against the inside of the balloon, causing it to stretch. More air forced in, more pressure, more stretching. That stretched rubber sheet is trying to pull back together. It's like a big three-dimensional rubber band squashing the air inside. So when you remove the restriction, the air rushes out. But of course, we had two balloons connected together. When I opened the valve, the air could move freely between the two balloons and it moved in this direction, but what determined that? Right, so with a balloon, you assume that... <laughs> with a balloon, you assume that the more air you put in, the higher the pressure gets inside. Right? Which makes sense, right? Because you force more air in, stretch that rubber sheet more, it pulls back together even stronger and the pressure should increase. The small one's not being stretched as much, so surely it's at a lower pressure. In which case, the air should move from high pressure to low pressure. But we now know that it doesn't do that. If it doesn't do that, Either the universe is broken, possible, or the larger balloon wasn't under the higher pressure. If the air is moved from the small balloon to the large balloon, the small balloon must be the one at the highest pressure. There's a beautiful mathematical way to show you this, which I'll do in a sec. First though, you will have experienced this yourself. Oh, my balloon went flying, didn't it? Hang on. The hardest part of blowing up a balloon is those first couple of breaths. And that's because that's when the latex, the rubber, is at its thickest. So it requires the greatest force to stretch it, which means that a balloon is at its highest pressure when it's small. That's the practical, intuitive explanation. But let's get to the theoretical one. In 1949, Hubert James and Eugene Guth were the first to draw up an equation for how a piece of rubber behaves. Um, this is the force on the small piece of rubber, uh, and it's related to the amount of stretch, and it depends on the temperature and the internal pressure and volume. Then in 1977, David Merritt and Fred Weinhaus wanted to look at how the pressure changes inside a balloon. So what they did was they made a few assumptions. They assumed that the temperature doesn't change, all right, that the amount of rubber doesn't change, okay, uh, and that the balloon was spherical, but it's physics, so that's kind of an okay approximation. And what they got was this. Now, again, don't worry about the equation itself. It's what the graph this equation produces tells us that's gonna be really interesting. So, this is the pressure inside the balloon. And this, um, the x-axis, is the ratio between the initial radius, 
R0, and the radius once the balloon is inflated. That's helpful because before the balloon gets inflated at all, uh, R divided by R0 is going to be 1. Once you inflate it to twice the size of the initial radius, R over R0 is 2, etc. Okay. This curve really nicely explains that experience when you first blow up a balloon. So the pressure increases really quickly. That's why it's really hard to get those few breaths in. And then you reach this maximum point of pressure. And that's at 1.38 times the initial radius of the balloon. And then when you start putting more air into the balloon, the pressure actually decreases. It gets easier. And you'll experience this next time you try to blow up a balloon. You can try to find that maximum point. Merritt and Weinhaus tested this graph experimentally and they found that it did match uh, what happens in practice pretty well, albeit when they juggled it around a bit. So different balloons behave in different ways and in fact the same balloon can behave in different ways depending on the initial radius and the initial pressure. And there's a great video uh, by the Action Lab where he puts a pressure sensor, a manometer, inside a balloon and then inflates it. And you see this, this lovely curve being produced. What we can now do is plot our demo on the graph, what's known as a scenario of two balloons of unequal radii, as J.S. Miller called it in 1952. Now, our two balloons, it's very hard to get both balloons uh, here on this quick bit, this inflation section where the pressure's going up really fast because the difference in radius, the difference in size is negligible. So therefore there are two scenarios likely for our demo. Either you could have the two balloons on each side of the peak. This one's going to be the bigger balloon. This one's going to be the smaller balloon. Or both balloons could be inflated to a size that they're both on the right-hand side on the downslope after that maximal point. Bigger balloon, smaller balloon. So let's start with that first scenario. Now, when I open the valve, the air is going to move from the balloon at higher pressure to the balloon at lower pressure. So the air is going to move in this direction, at which point this large balloon is going to have more air in it, so it's going to get bigger. Doing so is going to push it down the slope and its pressure is going to decrease. This small balloon is going to lose air, so it's going to get smaller, pushing it down this curve and its pressure is going to decrease. So both balloons, pressure decreases. They should technically meet at a point where they have equal pressure. Great. On to the second potential scenario. This is the one that I think is more likely that our initial state of our two balloons was in, because it's very hard to keep the balloon uh, on the left-hand side of this pressure maximum. So here, they're both larger than this point of maximum pressure. The smaller balloon is at the higher pressure still, right? And the larger balloon is at the lower pressure still. So when I open the valve, it's going to move from high pressure to low pressure, from the small balloon to the big balloon. The big balloon is going to increase in size, which also lowers its pressure. Meanwhile, the small one gets even smaller. Now this is where it gets interesting and it's had us racking our brains for the last couple of weeks, because you might think that when this gets smaller, its pressure increases. What it does is it quickly goes over the peak and then drops such that they do end up at equal pressures, which could make sense. Or the deflation curve could be different to the inflation curve. And actually what happens is it slides down a different curve, ending up smaller at an equal lower pressure. We'd love to know your thoughts on this. That's what I reckon. I think it's such an interesting demo. Jot your ideas down in the comments below. Thanks for watching. By the way, I've just released the first ever YouTube course on science communication over on my YouTube channel. It's a series of 10 videos on how to talk with the public about anything from the world of science, technology, engineering, or maths. Uh, I've written it predominantly for practicing scientists, but should be useful for anyone interested in giving science communication a go. It covers how to give a talk, run a workshop, form science demos, or make a YouTube video about science. Do go check it out. And if you haven't yet subscribed, to the Royal Institution channel, do hit the little subscribe button below and you can also support them on Patreon as well. See ya!